Hi folks, uh, it's James here. Welcome to another video. Uh, something a little bit different. Um, thought I'd do something with uh, CDs and just try and relax the pace a little bit. I often feel with my videos, you know, and I'm showing vinyl records all the time. It's just gets a bit manic somehow. So um, I'm actually sat in the office here on my on my couch. This is my CD listening couch. Uh, I sit here every evening and just listen to CDs and. Um, it occurred to me that um, you know I, I spend a lot of time on YouTube talking about records that I don't know, you know, showing things that I've just bought, and I sometimes get the feeling that I'm just flicking through things and not really going into too much depth, and that's partly because obviously you know when you're buying new stuff, you might have listened to it once or twice, and then you're talking about it and showing it, and uh, so I thought it'd be interesting to maybe talk about some uh, some records that I know much better and. Um, a lot of those are on CD. Um, I've got a huge CD collection, and I've been delving into it, you know, every night for months and months. So um, yeah, you know, give it a try. Why not? Um, this is my latest uh, CD purchase. This is a band called How. Um, got Rob Walker to thank for this. Um, Irish group. Um, don't think they've made many records. In fact, this might be their only album. Um, they're on rough trade. The CD cover has fallen to pieces. Quick shout out to uh, is it Julius Jabba? Great uh, VC channel. Um, he he did a video a couple of nights ago, I think, about CDs and just how jewel cases are really awful. <laughs> that uh, demonstrates that very well. Um, yeah, they're an Irish group. Really nice, very very kind of you know melodic, a bit kind of Beach Boysy. Bit of a 60s vibe going on. Anyway, I don't actually know that album very well, so that rather defeats the object uh, of me doing a video <laughs> talking about records that I know well. But yeah, that's my most recent CD purchase. So I'll flick through some stuff that I've been listening to and we'll kind of see see where we get to. This is... Um, sorry, the light in here is a little bit on the poor side. This is uh, Van de Graaff Generator and uh, Porn Hearts, which I dug out... Um, a while ago, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I kind of dug it out. I, I got it on the iPod again, went back to it. Really, really mad album, you know, really, really insane. Uh, quick shout out to um, Roswell Ryan, who's a big fan of this uh, band. He's going to go and see them live, I believe, in Manchester. So, yeah, Van de Graaff Generator is, uh, is Peter Hamill. I don't know a great deal of his music, but he's one of these kind of cult figures from the early 1970s, going back into the late 60s, and um, it's kind of true, it's true prog, you know, it's kind of art prog. Prog has got a bit of a kind of dirty association in many people's minds as being this kind of um, bloated thing, I suppose, which came around in the 1970s. I think because it was <clears throat> it was taken to such excess by bands like Yes and you know. ELP and there was such an emphasis on virtuosity I suppose and just being able to play your instrument really well you know you had your Rick Waitmans and you had your Steve Howes and you know they could you know with Yes <clears throat> often and with ELP it always seemed like a cutting contest they were just showing off all the time and you know trying to outdo each other but Van de Graaff Generator was something different um, there was a lot of virtuosity but I think the chief thing that they did really was, I suppose, focus on atmosphere. Um, and I suppose you describe the atmosphere as rather foreboding, dystopian, but with moments of kind of mad, insane humour. Um, really, really off the wall lyrics, uh, and just very kind of dark textures. It's got a very dark feel to it. You know, if you like um, uh, Red by King Crimson, it's got that same kind of very dark, ominous feel. Lots going on, you know, they kind of fill the soundscape with, with noise and sound and clamour, but they do drop down to kind of quiet stuff as well. It's, it's a really, really um, strange album, um, Van de Graaff Generator. It's the only album of theirs I actually know. Uh, I do have a couple of Peter Hamill solo records that I need to revisit, but um, yeah, the clock thickens. <laughs> um, that's one of the tracks on it. John Lydon was a big fan of theirs, which I always thought was quite interesting. You know, this kind of ground zero, iconoclastic kind of punk guy, you know, from the mid-1970s. But, I mean, he 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 loved German, 
German electronic music and he loved Van de Graaff Generator as well and uh, I don't think the punks ever really developed any particular hostility to them you know they weren't they weren't seen as being part of that pack of um, self-indulgent prog heads who were around in the 1970s actually this this really is very very similar to early David Bowie it contains a lot of stuff which sounds like early Bowie but also sort of mid 1970s Bowie as well uh, I think um, Diamond Dogs it's got a kind of arty very left field um, quality to it which uh, is just really compelling so yeah Van de Graaff Generator and Porn Hearts that's been lighting up my iPod and I'm inside here listening to it. This is a, a CD that I've been revisiting lately. This is um, Sonic Youth and uh, Murray Street, which is possibly my favourite Sonic Youth album. Um, I sort of come and go with Sonic Youth. I sometimes find them just too blizzardy, too monotonous. I've got to be in the mood for them. I used to, I used to be in a job. I used to work in a job that I really hated, and I used to listen to Sonic Youth on the CD player going to work in the morning <clears throat> and uh, it, it worked perfectly uh, I listened to it on the way to work and it would just you know I don't know it helped me to articulate something something emotional I think um, but I've got to be in the mood for it this album it's more of a melodic one I'm not sure of the date of this one but it's got it's kind of more song based than a lot of their stuff there's only one big kind of Freak Out, uh, which is I think is on Karen Revisited, and they do the just the usual Sonic Youth thing, you know, building and building with all these kind of just immense guitar textures and feedback and drones. But there's also a very strong lyrical angle on this album. There's a great song in here called Disconnection Notice, which is very sort of novelistic. It's like reading, I don't know, like a sort of Douglas Copeland novel or something. Uh, you sort of imagine this, I don't know, this kind of end of the world scenario. He sings in it, you know. Did you get your dis? Did you get your disconnection notice? Uh, mine, mine came in the mail yesterday, or something like that. Anyway, and you get this sense of a, of a society which is in meltdown, and it's very melancholy. It's very heartfelt, which Sonic Youth sort of isn't. They're quite a cold band sometimes, but this record has got a kind of warmth to it. It's um. It's got that scuzzy sound, but like I said, it's just got that lyrical thing, and the songs draw draw me in <clears throat> more than the stuff on, you know, say, uh, you know, Goo and all those other records that they made. Um, so yeah, oh, 2002. I'm just kind of seeing here now on Geffen. Worth checking out. I'll try and do a bit of a playlist um, down below so you can check out some of these things. But yeah, but Dis Disconnection Notice is a great song, and also Rain on Tin as well is a good song and I love that I love that imagery disconnection notice and then rain on tin you get this picture of just rain landing on a rooftop you know and people have been disconnected there's no electricity and um, yeah a bit like the um, porn heart one it's got a kind of dystopian darkness to it uh, which is very um, which is very compelling by the way the music that's playing in the background um, there's another album I've gone back to recently on CD. I don't have it on vinyl. Uh, this is um, Elton Dean and uh, Nine Cents. Elton Dean was the guy from um, A Soft Machine. Famously, uh, Elton John um, got the name Elton John. Reg Dwight got the name Elton John by putting together the names uh, Elton from Elton Dean. And I think it was Long John Baudry, who were both musicians that he played with. Uh, you know, in his obscure days. Elton Dean um, never had any interest in being a pop star and being commercial, you know. He put together this group uh, in the 1970s. It's got a great lineup on this album. You've got, you've got um, Alan Skidmore on tenor sax, who I saw back in the day in Leeds, uh, in a cellar bar in Leeds. He's a very, very um, John Coltrane influenced sax player, very free, very intense. Also on this record, you've got Harry Beckett, uh, the great uh, South African trumpet player and flugelhorn player. And um, this is actually a double CD. It's got Happy Days on it uh, and Over the Edge as well. I think Over the Edge is a live record. Um, Happy Days, you can sort of hear it now. It's kind of... Um, not entirely sure how they put this music together. It's sort of... 
it sounds partly composed and partly improvised. Um, maybe they've got some charts, I'm not sure, but it's, there's a lot of sort of slow brooding stuff with all these kind of um, textures, you know, the horns playing these very long legato lines over each other and sort of just building, it's got that kind of fervency to it, this, the uh, spiritual side to it. And then it goes into these really sort of rambustious free passages which are very explosive and very um, reasonably hard to listen to at times you know it's it's not it's not an easy record it's uh, it's quite uncompromising um, but yeah yeah I mean it kind of goes into more of a groove you can hear this in the background now it goes into a sort of Coltrane-y it sounds very British it's got a very British jazz sound to it but yeah but it also sounds quite American doesn't it you can sort of imagine this being Elvin Jones and McCoy Tyner. Great, uh, great record. I saw him actually too back in the day, Elton Dean, in the same venue that I'd seen Alan Skidmore. Um, he was doing a very, very free jazz thing. I don't remember who he was with, but um, it was a good gig. Uh, yeah, and, and unfortunately he's no longer with us. He passed away some time ago, but um, yeah. Great album, Nine Cents, Happy Days. I don't want this video to be too long, so uh, I'll just squeeze through. This is um, a box set I've been revisiting again recently. This is Charles Mingus, eight classic albums on four CDs. Really good. It's got some great, great stuff on it. I love the um, vinyl style CDs. Um, Mingus at the Bohemia from 1955. You've got um, Jazzical Moods from 1954, which I think was a 10-inch jazz record. That, that's got some fantastic stuff on it. Um, Mingus in Wonderland, uh, The Clown from 1957, Mingus 3 from 57, Charles Mingus Quartet and Max Roach. It's just a really, really good box set. And um, I've sort of got to be in the mood for Charles Mingus. Um, his stuff is very... Uh, it's not very sort of laid back. It's not kind of... It's not like blue note jazz where you can just put it on in the background and groove groove away to it. It sort of demands your attention. I often liken him to like a little dog who's constantly jumping up and yapping at you, you know, it's, he kind of wants your attention. It's very sort of his music is quite carnival esque, you know, it's got lots of whizz whizzes and bangs to it and um it's quite spectacular sounding. Um and it's very sensual as well though. Um his music does beckon you in if you kind of you know get into the zone for it and uh, I'd love to have some of his stuff on record not easy to come by um, I do have a couple of his albums on vinyl but um, yeah that's quite a nice way to uh, experience a bit of Mingus on a budget that's uh, Real Gone Jazz superb just another couple more um, this is the High Llamas and just get the angle right on this one. Uh, the High Llamas and Gideon Gay, which was their first album. This is Shauna Hagen's band. He's an Irish singer-songwriter, and he formed this band in the 90s, and they were sort of part of that kind of alternative scene in the 90s. Um, I think he'd been in the band already with somebody from Stereo Lab, and he had, he had connections to that kind of post-rock scene that was around in the 90s, and... Um, he had a very, very interesting mix of influences. You had this sort of Beach Boys thing in there, but also electronica and South American music as well. He sort of mixed it all together. Um, very colourful music, very vibrant, amazingly tuneful. I, I don't know where he gets his melodies from. He just seemed to be touched with a gift, really. You know, this kind of these silvery tunes that just seem to be falling from his fingers. You know, just really kind of amazing... Brian, I think Brian, I suppose Brian Wilson is, is his major touchstone. You know, he can do all those harmonies and just the wonderful, you know, that kind of creamy melodicism. Um, this is the only record of theirs that I actually have and know, and I need to check out more of their stuff. I know Peter Buck from REM is a big fan of theirs, and um, they never really achieved much commercial success, but I think they were quite influential. And um, yeah, if you're, if you're a fan of the Beach Boys or... 60s music, you know, 
psychedelia, the beetles, that kind of thing, the birds, um, then you'd enjoy that. Also, you know, if you enjoy slightly more symphonic kind of music, um, yeah, the High Lamas, Goody and Gay. Um, and we'll do two more, we'll do two more. Uh, morphine, like swimming. This was Mark Sandman's band, wasn't it? No longer with us, of course. Um, again, they were around in the 90s, a three-piece. Um, I think they described their, the genre of music which they worked in as something like it was like low, was it low rock or low music? It's very sort of dark, stripped down, jazzy. It's got saxophone in it. Uh, his, his vocals are quite croony, you know, think Nick Cave. If, I mean, if you like Nick Cave, you'll love Morphine. Very intense, but sort of quite poppy as well, quite kind of catchy. Uh, I think that's the jazz influence coming through. Really good album from 1997. And uh, yeah, again, not, not really a band that I pursued. I tend to find that with a lot of 90s music. You know, I was buying a lot of CDs back in those days, but I would I'd buy one CD and then I wouldn't necessarily follow it up in the way that I always have done with records, so uh, that's something that maybe I should think about, really. I'm not sure how many records they had, but um, that is a really great album. Um, yeah, Morphine, Like Swimming. Okay, we'll do one more. Just been listening to this tonight. This is uh, XTC. Um, the Dukes of Stratosphere, Chips from the Chocolate Fireball. So this is the the EP and the album which they made back in the 80s when they were sort of... They were sort of at a low ebb, I think, at the time. It might have been during the period where they were going through all the, all the problems with Virgin Records, you know, being... Uh, or the, for some reason they were refusing to record. There was some sort of dispute they were having. Anyway, they wanted to record a kind of tribute to British psych, 60s psych, so they went into a studio and laid down these tracks and uh, it's just it's pretty far out stuff really it's quite amazing that they were able to duplicate just the sounds and the vibes I mean they had XTC had this absolute ace up their sleeve which was the guitar player Dave Gregory who could imitate anybody you know he was absolutely amazing on the guitar he was great on the piano as well you know he plays some really nice little piano runs in this the over I mean I suppose the overriding influence really is Revolver by the Beatles, you've got tracks on here which really do sound like Revolver, you know, tracks like uh, I'm Only Sleeping and um, Only a Northern Song as well with all the, you know, the backward brass loops and everything. And, um, it's just really clever the way they were just able to write these songs and the chord progressions and the riffs and the melodies and how it all hangs together and how it's produced. It just effortlessly seems to conjure up that world of, you know, lost and forgotten 60s uh, one-hit wonder psych groups. Um, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty far out stuff. The final track, Pale and Precious, is just it's just the most incredible Brian Wilson and Beach Boys um, pastiche. Pastiche is a bit of a negative word, really. I mean, it, it just sounds like a great lost Brian Wilson song. Um... So, yeah, I've not heard it for years. I've not heard it for a long time. Um, if there's a track to check out from this album, apart from Pale and Precious, I'd go for Vanishing Girl. She's got a fantastic pop hook to it. Really, really good. Um, yeah. Dukes, Dukes of Stratosphere, Chips from the Chocolate Fireball, featuring all of Sonic Sunspot and 25 O'Clock, uh, which was the EP that they'd done originally. So, yeah, that's just a small cross-section of what I've been listening to on the CD couch. So uh, I might try and do these quite regularly, maybe every Sunday evening or something. We'll see anyway. Um, kind of like a sort of like a video diary for me, really, you know, if anybody else watches, all well and good. So anyway, if you have watched, and um, then I appreciate it, and uh, I hope to be back soon. Take care, folks. Have a wonderful week. See you soon. Bye-bye.